session day a little bit, you know, I didn't plan the, I didn't plan the Thanksgiving, or I didn't plan the, the annual picnic, you know, this week, terrible. Um, I also, this week, normally I'll have a Psalms picked out, you know, what Psalm I want to read on Sunday morning. I didn't have a Psalms picked out this morning, profession, I just turned to Psalms, and I said, I said, Psalms 51, all right. You guys are laughing. <laughs> Psalms 51. And I read some Psalms. And then, so me and Amy, we don't, we didn't talk this week either, because I was just too, I'm just, I was just being me this week, because I was just doing stuff. And so we didn't even, so I don't even know what Psalms that we're going to sing this morning. And God, it was so good. And even in, even in my Luke's this week, man, it worked together. God is good. And why that whole song was all talking about, man, salvation. He's good because of salvation. And David in Psalm 51 is all about, hey God, I messed up and I'm thankful for your salvation. Anyway, I wanted to point that out to you. Because sometimes with God, sometimes things are like really amazing. Like we have like, I know what God is going to say and God is going to do and like give me this plan. And, and we hear stories like that. I get really encouraged by stories of, there's this video called The Finger of God. It talks about all these stories of, of people just going and saying yes to Jesus and, and, and God giving them downloads of what to do that day. Yeah. Really cool stories. Like one, he said, God told this man, hey, go to the, go to the center square. And there's going to be somebody with uh, white hair and dressed in orange, right? And he goes and he finds him. And that person was also had a dream. Hey, I need to go to the center, uh, the center square and there's going to be an individual there that I want to talk to. It's, it's amazing. And sometimes, even in our, like, I don't know, God, okay, here you go. We're going to read this morning. And God still works. And God weaves it all together for his story. And I just wanted to encourage you guys that as we look and we just continue to expect God to do stuff among us, that he sometimes works just ordinary ways too. And it still all works together and he gets the glory. And it's really fun that way. Man, last few weeks, we've been going through the series. Called, uh, uh, called Live Like Kings. And we've been walking through Matthew chapter 5 and talking about the Beatitudes. Because Jesus was an amazing king. He, was, he had all authority in heaven. He had all position. He had all power. He had, he had everything. But yet he came and he served us. And unlike any earthly king, he didn't hold it over us, his lordship. No, he served us even to the point of death. And the way that he taught us to live through the Beatitudes is sometimes radical. It sometimes challenges us. It, it challenges me consistently. Okay, this isn't how I would normally respond to this circumstance. But Jesus teaches us how to live in such a way that brings the Father glory and allows us to live like a king. Live like Jesus. And this week we're going to continue. I, I said we're going to continue on the, the Sermon on the Mount. That's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and a little bit of 7. And so this week we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 13 today. So Matthew chapter 5, and we're in verse 13. We have one verse today, Pastor? One verse today. But I believe through this one verse, God will unpack for us, and over the next three weeks, we're going to be doing a series called Salt and Light. So our base verse that we're going to jump from is Matthew chapter 5, and then uh, 5 verse 13 through 16, and then next week we'll talk about being light. This week we're going to talk about salt, next week light, and then the third week our Thomas will be here, and I believe in, and I hope that you guys can can believe in faith with me. That that Sunday is going to be a special Sunday. Uh, and one, it's going to empower us as a church to go and pray for the sick and see the sick made whole. I believe that's going to happen. We're going to be equipped as a church. But I also believe, uh, as our ministry, that people in the room with us, the people that are gathered here, are going to experience some miracles of God. So, so be praying with me that that Sunday, as we close this series, uh, Salt and Light, that uh, this, that Sunday, God is going to do some amazing things together. So let's look again, Matthew chapter 5, and let's read verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth. 
you know what, I want to stay, I'm going to just come pause there. I'm not going to read the rest of it yet. <laughs> you are the salt of the earth. You know, I, I will get to the warning part. There is, there is some, there is some warning. There is, there is something Jesus is saying. But I love how Jesus starts off with identity statements. You are the salt of the earth. Not that many people are excited about that. You're like, what does that mean, Pastor Andrew? You are the salt. This is an identity statement for us as believers. Just like we can call ourselves the children of God, we can call ourselves the salt of the earth. And it means something for us. It's going to, as we look through the scripture today, it's going to challenge, it's going to encourage us, I believe, of who God says that we are. Alright, so let's dig into this. Alright, I mean, I'm still in that, that same blank as David. You are the salt of the earth. What is that saying? First, Jesus is saying, you are the preservation. You are the one that preserves the earth. That's you. Yeah, I'm talking to each one of you this morning. That, that's me this morning. We're the ones that preserves the earth. As we look at this word salt, there's so many implications of it. We have to go back, you know, when I thought about bringing a whole bunch of salt packets from McDonald's or something, you know, and, and passing it out to everybody. So we have this, this memory. You know, today, salt, we think about maybe <coughs> salty chips, salty fries are good, you know, salt, the salty thing. But no, when we, when we look at the scripture, and we have to look, at, and every time I do scripture readings, and when I'm studying, I, I have to look at the, the context, where it is at that day, what are they saying about so what does it mean to their society? Because what, what we will learn is as we examine what it means to their society, then it will have bigger implications about what she's saying when he said, you are the salt. The first thing that salt was used for when he says, you are the salt, he's saying, you are the preservation of the earth. Salt was needed to preserve meat. Right? We... We couldn't, at that point, there wasn't any refrigeration. Uh, I know sometimes in my refrigerator, things still spoil. I don't know about yours, you know, I still find that thing in the back of the corner. But in, without it, I mean, it would, it would spoil quickly. So, so salt was used to preserve meat. Why? Because it has, it has some antibacterial uh, qualities to it. And so it allowed the salt to, to the, the meat to last longer as they preserved it. And it wasn't just a little bit of salt like you, you like to just salt your food a little bit. No, they packed it full. It was, it was all around. It was surrounding it. it had to, the, the meat had to be deep inside the salt. And it wasn't just those little sparkles of salt, those little, little grains of salt that we get. It was like rock salt. It just, Pack it in there, and so that the, the meat would not spoil. You guys remember it, the, why this was a difficult thing uh, when the when the Israelites were going through the wilderness, and Jesus gave them instruct or God gave them the instructions, right? That there's going to be manna and there's going to be quail that was present for them. And what would happen if they, if they didn't if they ate too much or they took too much that day? It, it spoiled within a day. I mean, it it was something that was. Very, would be very foreign to our American lifestyle where, hey, we can go and our food is usually packed full of preserves, or we have a refrigerator or a freezer or a deep freezer if we want it to stay longer, and so we can just keep food. But when he's saying this to us as the church, you are the salt of the earth, I believe he's saying you are the ones that preserve the earth. You're the ones that keep society from spoiling we look around, things are a little off in our society. Every day there's something more in the news. I know I was just on Facebook uh, earlier this morning, I know. Pastor gets on Facebook in the morning too. It's a habit I have to break. But you know, and they were just talking about last night. All the people in Madison, all, all crazy because oh, Madison, we had a shooting in, in Madison last night. And we were like, oh man, they, they, you know, it, Madison was this peaceful place. It's like this place that, you know, there's no crime. And it's like this best place to live, the best neighborhood kind of thing. And then, boom. And it's shaking people a little bit. Society around us is changing. It's spoiling. Yeah. Yeah. Sin continues to have its way in people's life. And it will continue to look disarrayed and continue to get worse. And it will continue to happen. It's always been that way because it went sin into the world. And it always will be the way. And Jesus says to us, you are the salt of the earth. You are the preservation of the earth. Yeah. Live like a king. Live in the Beatitudes. Fall off the Beatitudes. It isn't, it isn't a misfit that Jesus makes this statement right after the Beatitudes. 
The Beatitudes, what were they? They were all about how we should live. Yeah. How we should live differently compared to the society around us. How we should, as we said, even change our behavior, change our actions, change our thoughts. Be peacemakers. Man, be merciful. Be these things. And in doing so, you preserve the earth. Just that. You change the society. You keep it from rotting. You keep it from spoiling. By acting and living like Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. What do we also bring as salt? What is what is salt's main usage today? Every cook would know. Every meal, every sweet thing, every savory thing, everything needs salt. Did my cook say amen? Amen. 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 Right? Right? amen. We have to have salt. Why? Why does salt, what does salt do to a dish? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of MasterChef. I like MasterChef, and Gordon Ramsay, he's on there, and he has all these home cooks, and the home cooks are doing their thing. You know, they make this pretty dish, and they have to present it like it's a, like they're presenting in a four-star restaurant. So they make it all pretty, right? And they'll go up there, and, and you hear it all the time. And, uh, Gordon Ramsay and the other judges, they'll taste the food, and they're like, oh, this looks, this looks so pretty, this is so nice. And say, ah, oh, I can see your flavor over here and here, but you missed the salt. <laughs> yeah. and then, but all you need is just a little dash of salt, just throw a little bit of salt. Why? Because salt enhances flavor. It brings out all the flavor. It, it brings out the, the wonderful thing. It meshes everything together. It's so good. I mean, I gotta have salt and put a little bit of salt in it. It enhances the flavor. You bring flavor to the earth. Why? Because later on, well, later on in verse 16, we're going to talk about this next week when we talk about light, but in, in verse 16, in the same way, it says, let your light shine before others, so that what? So that they will see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Go be flavorful. You enhance the earth, and when you enhance the earth, you bring glory to the Father. What does that mean, right? We're salt. We bring flavor by the way we live, by the way we act, because we're different, because we follow after Jesus, because we're merciful and we're peaceful because we, we give to others, we, we take care of those who are in weakened state. We by doing so, we enhance the flame. We bring glory to the Father. We lift up the Lord by the way that we live. You're the salt of You bring flavor by living differently because when you live differently, they see the Father. By the way we live, by what we do, we enhance Life. We bring glory to the Father. We bring light to His name, as we'll talk about next week. Our acts of grace and the sharing of the knowledge of Christ, it brings flavor to life. It elevates the Father. You are salt. You're the flavor. You're what people are missing. By saying, you are salt, I believe Christ was also saying, you are valuable. Yes. You're valuable. How do I know this? What do I look at? When I'm looking at the context of, uh, when I'm looking at the context and, and looking at society as it was, what was salt for them? Salt was a preservation. It was, it was used for medicine. It was a scarce commodity. And it was a necessity of life. It was used for value. You've heard the saying, maybe, that people are worth their weight in salt. I could have said that about these middle schoolers. I was like, man, they were just working. You know, Thursday was a hot day. I could tell, I could tell myself, this week was, I, 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 if I could record this week, uh, this is not the week to share with everybody how wonderful pastor's life was. Thursday, I got out to get my car and my, and my tire was flat. So me and Denver, wickety stickety, we uh, we put the new tire on there thanks to Dad teaching me how to change tires when I was younger, right? So I, I changed my tire. Then I got to the school. I was like, all right, I made a U-Haul reservation because we had all this stuff in a container at U-Haul. I needed a frame here. Went to the U-Haul. I had a reservation. Had my email. 915 pickup showed up. No truck there. <laughs> Working on me. <laughs> 
I had to go back and apologize to the, the, the poor store clerk. That I, just wasn't, I was just a little bit upset about that. And then I didn't get to go here. I didn't get to, so I come to, I come, it was, uh, I was supposed to be here at 9 o'clock with these middle schoolers. I didn't get here until about 9.40. Sorry, middle schoolers, you know, it's a rough morning. You know, be more like Jesus than Pastor was this morning. Shared with them a little bit. Said, hey, I was a little frustrated. And, uh, and they're like, it's all right, Pastor. What do you need to get done? Oh, so good. It was so good. And, and so they just work all week long. But, but where did this, this line come from? Uh, your word, your weight, and salt? Why? Because when a, when a soldier was paid, many times they were paid in salt. And you're worth it. You, you, you did a good job. Here's your payment. It's salt. That's how valuable salt was. That's so, all. Oh, this is so good, guys. You don't even know. You are salt. You are valuable. What kind of work did Jesus do? Come on. And his payment is us. We are salt. We are the payment of Christ. Christ went and he did the work. He lived perfectly. He went to the cross. He died on the cross. He rose again. And what was his reward? You. Me. We're his reward. Amen. We are the salt. We are the payment to Christ. We are valuable to him. And when he says here, Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth, you have extreme value. As I was continuing to look at this, Linda, a couple weeks ago, as I was preaching, uh, just said to me, she's like, hey, Pastor, I, as you were speaking, I just heard, uh, like, God tell me about, like, a salt covenant. And so we spent some time together talking about the salt covenant. And I was thinking about this today, uh, sorry, as I was preparing and, and, and making this point today. You are the salt of the earth. Is also a statement saying, you are the sign that the sacrifice will be kept. How we live is a sign that the sacrifice will be kept, that the promise of salvation would be kept. Well, a little bit of context here. In biblical times, a salt covenant was made when there was a promise made. When they had, a, when they made a, a deal with one another, they were they they made a promise to one another, and they would gather people together. It would be like a like a a, a ceremony almost of sorts. They would have a, a a promise, a covenant they made, some kind of a deal they made with one another, and they would say, "We need to make a salt covenant to seal the deal." And so what they would do, they would gather people around, and they would each take a spoonful, I don't know, a mouthful of salt, and that was a sign they would take, they would both take, the two parties would take the salt, put it in their mouth, and it would be a sign that the covenant, whatever deal they had made, was going to be kept. I was just really excited this morning, thinking about this again, and I, I, every Sunday I rewrite my message, and I'm saying, Salt, we are a sign that the covenant, the agreement, the restoration, the redemption of the world, the coming of Jesus, we are the sign that those things are to come. By how we live our transformed life, what Jesus does inside of us, what the Holy Spirit does inside of us, to make us more like Christ is a sign. It's a covenant. You are salt. You're like taking a mouthful of salt, saying, hey, the promise is coming. The redemption is coming. The restoration is coming. Jesus said, you are the salt. You're the sign that my word is true. Salvation is for all people. God, that's something to get excited about. How I live my life, what I do, the, the measure at which I live like a king, where I fall after Jesus, is a sign to others. Redemption is coming. The salvation is yours. God is for all people. So not only does Jesus start off this message, or I wouldn't say not only, Jesus starts off this message with a powerful identity statement to us. You are salt. You are the preservation. You are the preservation. 
You are the value. You are, you are valuable. You are the sign of the covenant that it will be restored. Man, good stuff from Jesus. Yeah. And he continues. Let's read the rest of verse 13. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost it ta its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Warning from Jesus. You're the salt. Yeah, you play a huge role. Don't lose your saltiness. Don't lose your saltiness. So you'll be good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. As I encouraged everybody earlier from our cooks in the room, they all said, yes, salt is important, right, in everything we do. But what happens, I want to look at two things this morning, what happens when we lose our saltiness. How does salt lose its saltiness? I believe there's two different things we can look at. One is that salt isn't good if it stays in the container. Right? And how many times, I, I told you already, not your chef, you know, and then and, and before I say, where's the salt? And they're like, oh, it's, it's back on my station, right? It doesn't do you any good. Salt does you no good in cooking if it just stays in the container. If it stays in the, if it just stays on the counter, it does you no good unless it's applied to the meat, unless it's sprinkled on the dish, unless it's out and it's used. I want to get some salt and just start tossing it on everybody. Right? It, 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 salt doesn't. All of all of the different. Um, Attributes of salt don't come to fruition unless it's applied, unless it's spread out, unless it's put on. How do we not lose our saltiness? Or what will happen? What causes us to lose our saltiness? We just stay in the container. I mean, it's awesome when we gather here together. It's awesome when we get to gather for prayer and, and when we gather in our in our Wednesday night missional groups. And, and I mean that's that's an amazing that's an amazing thing. But it does us no good. It's not it, we don't fulfill our full purpose unless we engage in those who are outside of the church. Engage with society. The warning here is don't lose your saltiness. Go out and use it. You're made for a purpose. You've been given an identity for a purpose. God wants us to be engaged with those who are around us. Meeting our neighbors. Last summer, we got, we got some simple examples. Go bake some cakes for your neighbors. Go bring some cookies over. Hey, go see your coworker. Ask them what they're doing for dinner that night. Everybody eats a meal. There's multiple ways in which we can engage in those who are around us so that they can receive the flavor. So they can see, remember, what does salt do? It enhances the flavor, right? It brings glory to God. Your design and purpose in Christ is to bring glory to the Father just as Christ got glory to the Father. But in this body of believers, man, we can celebrate with each other, we can get glad, we can, we can shout a little bit, but you know who needs to know the glory of the Father? Who needs that glory enhanced? Who needs to see the Father? Those who don't know him. And we are that example. How do you not lose your saltiness? Engage. Engage with the society. It's also a warning that we can lose our saltiness by living according to your own way. So Jesus makes this statement about saltiness right after he lays out the Beatitudes, how we ought to be living amongst the unbelievers in the world. We're to be living like him, like a king, in radical obedience to him. How do we lose saltiness? It begins by choosing our own way over the way of the Father, over the way of the Lord, over the way of the King. 
not heeding what Jesus has instructed us to live. To live in hate. <coughs> to be unmerciful. To love our sin rather than love the ways of God. This is the... Uh, every time I look at the words of Jesus, you know... Uh, I really, I really want to make Sunday mornings a super happy message every week. I challenge myself. This week, we're all going to leave full of smiles, and it's just going to be a glorious night. But every time I look at the words of Jesus, not only do they say like these amazing identity statements, you are salt, 